Hey leaders, welcome back to another episode of Leading Collaborative Response, where I have the opportunity to engage in a conversation with school administrator Colin Denoye and reflect on his experiences of collaborative response now through three different school organizations. Leading organizations with intentionality and purpose is complex work. And dedicated leaders work tirelessly each and every day to build impactful cultures of collaboration. But effective collaboration is difficult and messy. The good news is you don't have to do it alone. Join the Jigsaw Learning Team for Leading Collaborative Response, sharing insights for leaders committed to establishing, refining, and deepening collaborative response in their organization. And welcome back to another episode. Very privileged to be able to be joined by Colin Denoye, who is currently an administrator with the Medicine Hat Catholic Board of Education at St. Mary's uh, School. Is that correct, Colin? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you and I have had the opportunity to engage for a number of years, but for our audience, why don't you take a just an opportunity to share a little bit of your background as an educator, and then tell us a little bit more about the current school that you're at. Sure. Yeah, so I've um, worn many hats from the classroom teacher to being a lead teacher of a math and science department. And then I became a, an instructional coordinator for, for the division that I was at previously. And then from there into administration, uh, I was also online coordinator when we went to an online learning platform during the COVID years. And currently, yeah, I'm in Medicine Hat at St. Mary's Junior High School. It's a grade seven to nine school, and I am the vice principal here. Um, the school here is um, a general stream, but we also have French immersion in all three grades, and we have a fine arts academy that we run here as well. Oh, that's awesome, Colin. And like I said, you and I have known each other for now a number of years through a few different schools, and I'm really excited to engage in this conversation about now <laughs> in your third experience of introducing collaborative response, what that's looked like for you. But we're also really excited to have you coming to present at our 2024 collaborative response retreat and sharing a little bit of your school story as well. So going back, when you were first introduced to collaborative response, back in uh, Lakeland Catholic uh, Catholic schools. Do you wanna share just maybe some of your initial um, reactions or thoughts, how the work had come to you as, as not just a school administrator, but the division itself, and just some of your early reflections before we come in and talk about what does it look like in, in your different school capacities? It came into Lakeland Catholic at a very perfect time, actually. So. It was 2020, and so we had just entered into COVID, and so students were now online starting in February or March or whatever it was mm -hmm. of that year, and they were online until the end of the school year. The school division decided that they wanted to start an online learning program because we recognized that there would be many students that may not be coming back into the brick-and-mortar building, but choose the online. Uh, but the senior administration had reached out to you to also initiate collaborative response at the exact yeah. same time. And the timing was perfect um, because there was just so many unknowns going back into the school or going back into the online learning in September. And that was kind of, uh, we were presented with that. Uh, the end of the school year in 2020, the administrators were informed that we were going to take this direction and I got excited right from the get-go because there was just so many unknowns and um, and so that's how it started so I took on as the coordinator so I was the one getting the online learning program going but also initiating collaborative response at the same yeah. time so everything was kind of new right but yeah it was exciting. Well I remember when you were first engaging in the work because your team really took to especially the idea of the collaborative team meeting because the issues that were surfacing were at that time really novel or unique um, problems that were surfacing that you were just trying to all collectively figure out how to do this because there wasn't really a playbook uh, in place. And I remember being able to watch some of your team meetings happening online and the innovation and collaboration that it spurred between people who 
were likely not in the same even physical space. What were some of your learnings from that early on, especially around the collaborative team meeting, Colin? Yeah, you're you're right. Um, so we started off, and what was really interesting, you kind of alluded to it. We went an entire school year, the 2020 and 2021, where had the online learning teachers, and then there was myself. But during that entire school year, we were never face to face. So yeah. we were all in different locations doing the online. But we came together, uh, and it was interesting because we were able to use our separate, you know, digital rooms and go off into our meetings. But the conversations were very unique. It wasn't typical conversations because there wasn't was not classroom situations we were addressing. It really was the social, the emotional, the engagement, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. So the conversations took on a whole different avenue. And at that time, it was so important for us to come together because we needed to bounce ideas off of each other. There was no way, I, I think any online teacher could have done that in their own silo and you know had good outcomes with their students. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I know from that, you then moved into a, a principal role at a middle school within the same school division and kind of continued the, the work that had been started and then had the opportunity to move to your current school. So in a sense, introducing it into three different school environments, what were some things that when you came into your current school, and it happened to be right at a time when the school division there was also looking division-wide, um, and I know you were quite instrumental in helping that conversation along with, with the senior leadership, having had some experience as well. What were some things that, that you intentionally did as a leader, um, to introduce us now the third time into a, a school environment? What were, what would be some, some suggestions that you could pass along to people who are also looking to introduce the work? Yeah, so there was a couple of things. So one was um, last spring, I was able to just meet with the administrators and kind of go over after you had spoken to them about the framework and what the objective and what collaborative response was all about. And yeah, then, and it was a pretty big overview, like a pretty 10,000 foot view overview for the men at that time. It sure was. And then, so I followed up with that with just kind of my own personal experience and the benefits that I've seen out of it was just instrumental. And so had that, and then here at the school level, talked to the principal and the principal was definitely all in on this and mm -hmm. gave me the free reign to kind of get it going. So I started very slow. I started, um, you know, with the staff, just kind of giving them the background knowledge how this would look different than the meetings they were already having. Um, and, and just from those conversations, the teaching staff here was very intrigued as to uh, how would it be so different? And so mm -hmm. then, you know, they allowed me, they gave me the grace to kind of guide them into the process. And then in a very short period of time, they were all in and ready to go for it because they could immediately see the conversations, how effective they were and that, you were leaving with something tangible yeah. in hand to do, right? It wasn't just an empty conversation and then you never come back to it, right? So Yeah, so very much trying to be solutions oriented and, and really focused on actions right. from those conversations. So let's get into the weeds just a little bit then, Colin. Um, what does it look like, the collaborative structures and processes at the school currently? How many teams... How often do they meet? Do you have collaborative planning and collaborative team meetings established yet at this point? Just share out what it's looking like at the school thus far. Yeah, so what we decided to do is our school has weekly assemblies every Monday morning. Those assemblies last, you know, anywhere 40, 45 minutes in length. So okay. the principal will run those assemblies. So we've taken the teaching staff and we've divided them into three teams. So a third of those teachers will not be in an assembly. Okay. They will meet. Um, and how I made the teams was I was very intentional on making sure they were cross-graded, cross-subjects as well. I did not want a math team or a science team. I feel that's more of a PLC type group. Mm -hmm. where I wanted a wide range of diversity in those groups. 
So when we started, and and still to this day, I actually I just kind of, if you want to say I released them <laughs> just this month in December, but up until then, so every week I would take one of those groups out and we would just start. Then we just started first off was the norms. And so we just wanted to establish norms. Once we came with a common one between all three groups, that became our school norms for our collaborative response. Okay, so you've reached the place that we have for each of our three teams, we have a common set of norms that we've agreed are how we'll, how we'll engage? Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and then from there, we just continued on as to what the meeting would look like. So then I went into the roles and spent some time on that. Um, I had similar what I had done in the past in the other school is I, I made desktop placards, you know, so on the one side, it will say facilitator, but on the other side is the description. So it's a great reminder of the person that is the facilitator or timekeeper. They have the notes staring right at them. What is my role again? And, you know, so they don't forget that, but everyone can then see what everyone's doing. So mm -hmm. we spent some time on establishing what roles look like. And every school is different, but I really wanted my teachers to be comfortable with every role. So I don't keep the same facilitator or same timekeeper. It gets mixed up every time they meet. Interesting. I, you know, we often talk about that. What has been your teacher's reactions to the idea that I might get asked to facilitate one of these at, at the different points? Yeah, it's a good question because at the beginning they were totally um submissive to myself right leading yeah. them and guiding them and then i was kind of giving them a snapshot of what it was looked like they were a bit nervous but actually how i presented it was i says think of us as a restaurant and i says you know you have dishwashers you have cooks prep cooks you have a hostess waiters waitress and i says i think a, a restaurant would be very effective no matter what job you were hired for if you could spend a couple hours doing each of those roles you would learn to appreciate what the dishwasher has oh, to do, smart, learn right. to appreciate what a hostess has to do, all those things, right? And so yeah. they took that on, they recognized, yeah, that that's important. And, you know, so the, the interrupter is not so nervous of interrupting, right? Because they're going to be interrupted at some point in time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. So then do the teams essentially have every third week, if I understand this correct, that they would then engage in a collaborative team meeting together? That's correct, yes. And I love that idea too, because the way you've set that up, it does give you the flexibility, potentially in time, that you could mix teams, you know, at at the end of a semester, we're going to regroup again, like, not that you want to do that while they're still learning the process, but the the structure gives you that possibility long term. Right, yeah, I, I think so. And I had told them that, you know, there was a possibility that I might mix them up February, March, but we're playing it by year because I don't want to, you know, mix things up and then things go sideways. I want to make sure mm -hmm. they're solved first. But so with those meetings, then, uh, Colin, how has it evolved within the school in regards to me knowing who I should be bringing forth? Um, because we know within that collaborative team meeting, we want to be able to say that, you know, I've brought forth this student. This is my key issue. We attach other students and then let's open up our toolboxes. How have you helped support or where, how has it evolved in regards to knowing who, who's, who's coming forth in those conversations? We'll be right back to continue this episode. We have all felt like this before when engaging in team meetings, feeling like our time is not being maximized or that this could have just been an email. As a leader, how can we ensure this is not the reality for everyone in the room? Rather than just simply coming together into a shared space, we really need to ensure that whenever we are engaging as a team in meetings, that the time is being utilized to its utmost and that we are truly seeing impact as a result of our conversations. My name is Curtis Hewson, lead learner and co-founder of Jigsaw Learning. In this free on-demand webinar, I'm going to be sharing with you five planning considerations and then five facilitation considerations that you can put into place as a leader to take your team meetings to the next level. Access this webinar and in addition to these 10 considerations, numerous free resources will be shared that you can begin using immediately. I can't wait to have you join me to learn how we can ensure that team meetings are having their optimal impact. 
And now back to our conversation. Yeah, so one of the big ones was that pre-meeting organizer. So I spent some time on the importance of that. So what I've done right now is I've asked all of the teachers when they bring their pre-meeting organizer, and I've given them the option that they can bring the paper, hard copy, or digital, whatever they want. But um, for now, other than celebrations, just the key issues, I've asked them not to name the student, just name mm -hmm. the key issue. I want them to get used to hearing a key issue and everyone now is kind of unbiased, right? I just, right. I want the conversation to be so broad and open right now. And everyone needs to fill out the pre-meeting organizer. So we've done a couple mock, uh, if you want to call it mock meetings. Mm -hmm. We've gone through it. And so now they can kind of see that, wow, not only do I bring up a key issue, we discuss it and we're leaving with an action within just minutes. It's not a 20 minute conversation. And then we yeah. go on to the next, right? And people also will bring a key issue in, but you know, John could bring up one and then Sam's like, oh yeah, that's actually my key issue. So, you know, we're killing two birds with one stone kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, interesting. Um, so then when you think about the continuum of supports, Colin, and I know that as a school division, we've just with with all of your uh, colleagues in schools have been going very slow as well and intentional. And we haven't yet dove into the continuum of supports. But from your past experience, have you started any of those conversations or have you strictly um, focused on just the collaborative structures and processes to to start off with? Yeah, so up till now, it's been the structures and processes. However, mm -hmm. what I did was, is I used my experience from the past and I kind of created uh, some continuum of sport, supports just as a blueprint. So I have one for like numeracy, one for literacy, one for just kind of this, uh, the happenings of a classroom, and then one for social emotional. And so what I did was, is I put that in a shared drive that I created for collaborative response. And I put them in there and this past go round, I just informed the teachers that they're sitting there, that they can start to look at them and that they're working documents. And so right now I had asked them, if you think of something to add to it, let's put it on a separate document for now, just to make sure that we're putting it, you know, whether it's an intervention or strategy and making sure we're putting it in the right tier as well. Right. Yeah. Because that's a, going to take quite a while for them to learn that, but I wanted them to just kind of see that something is there to start with. Oh, that's smart. So really it's just, we're experiencing it right now without yet getting to a co-creation or, or purposeful focus around it. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So Colin, is there anything, uh, and I have have a few other questions that I'll ask around lessons learned in that, but is there anything that you did differently coming into St. Mary's than what you may have done at two previous schools to be able to introduce or, and I guess in one case, it was more of a reintroduce or re reinforce anything that you've done differently this time based on the past experiences? Um, not a whole lot different in the process. Like I, like if I were to look at like a long range plan that I have for myself, it's pretty much the same, but how I presented it, this go around was different than in the past, simply because mm -hmm. in the past, um, no matter what school I would have gone into, I would have known all the teachers, right? I had been in that division for so long and yeah. wearing different hats. Here I was new, new administrator. They didn't know me. So the introduction of it and the division taking it on really wanted to kind of give them a book study of the collaborative response mm -hmm. first rather than just kind of trust me, we're doing this, you know, yeah. I really wanted them to wrap their head around how this is going to be so much different. Because when I first introduced it to the staff, that was one of the comments that came back right away is, well, we already meet, you know, as teachers. Yeah. And so I wanted to say, what, what does that look like? You know, if in your dream world, how could it be different? But what was interesting, even when I posed that question, they weren't sure in a dream world, what it would look like until I started, 
you know, dropping. Yeah. Here's what it could look like, right? And then, then well, they got intrigued by it. Yeah. Well, and that's really reinforcing that ready, fire, aim idea, right? Of you could sit and explain it for hours upon hours, but just getting in and experiencing is probably more powerful for people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting too, that whole idea of trust me, this is a good thing uh, that works when you have really solid relationships that are built on years of interactions. But when you're fresh and use the trust me, it doesn't always cut the same way, does it? That's right. And then also actually coming into this position in this school, I had a bit of an advantage because I was able to start immediately in our very first staff meeting at the end of August. Yeah. And so I had some time to work with the staff prior to the whole division hearing you at the end of September. So when my school went to hear you, they were connecting the dots, right? They could see, ah, oh, okay, it's now. So to them, it was all making sense at that point. Right? Yeah, actually, they were probably at a little bit of leg up on their other colleagues from other schools that were getting it pretty from a, a, a cold spot, I guess, of right. really hearing it for the first time. So, Colin, when we think about those three foundational components of the collaborative structures and processes, data and evidence, evidence and continuum of supports, what would you say would be some key learnings that you've made um, around each one? Yeah, so yeah, the structures and processes to me is the essential. It's the, it's the backbone in order for yeah. collaborative response to function properly. I think if you were to overlook that and kind of have the mindset that I know how to meet or matter of fact, I remember back in 2020 when we were first introduced to the idea of roles, I, even myself, I was like, really, we're going to do roles here. And but, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, Right. But the benefit was, it was huge. So, um, so yeah, the structures and processes, I would, I've encouraged the administrators in this division, take your time on that, make sure that that is solid before, mm -hmm. you know, really getting going. Because if that's not solid, then your conversations aren't going to be what they're intended to be, right? You, you don't yeah. want to do what you've done in the past, right? That we know that that's not overly effective. So we need to build this. So that is the key from that. And then the data and evidence that really helps drive the conversations. Um, so we do have a spreadsheet. Um, and again, so the principal that's here actually had already started working on a spreadsheet for himself. Yeah. And then I came with that experience and our, we just had this nice, beautiful, elaborate spreadsheet of all of our students. Um, you know, every assessment and everything's on there. And mm -hmm. So teachers are drawing upon that spreadsheet on a daily basis. So it's in our Google Drive and mine is open all the time. And yeah, you can see teachers popping into it all day long. So it brings a smile to your face knowing that they're accessing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. And so, yeah. so yeah, the, so that part is important. And then the continuum of supports, which is to me, it's kind of like that final piece of the puzzle um, that's the one that probably, in my opinion, probably takes the most work at and to be the most patient with. And like I told the teachers here, you know, don't think of this as a one year process, you know, like this is long term and not everything's going to be ready by Christmas nor by June. So let's just take it one step. And that's the process that we're using. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And again, it's that idea that, we're making incremental steps, but when you look at those incrementals over a long-term picture, it's massive movement or, or shifts for a, a school and its culture. So Colin, I'd love for you to uh, finish this statement here um, for me of when you think about your prior organizations in any of the ones that you've been in regards to collaborative response, when you think about them prior to collaborative response, how would you have characterized what what you were doing or if you could finish it with you know we were like this because we often talk about collaborative response is not about throwing away everything that you do and starting something fresh and brand new but how do we build upon it so when you think about your organizations prior to collaborative response how would you 
characterize them? And then my next question after that would be, as a result of introducing what have been some of the key things that you've seen or impact? Yeah, so prior to Collaborative Response, we were a division that had set aside time in a calendar. So we had these early dismissal Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. um, we, a number of years ago, really dove into PLCs, um, the Rick DeFores PLCs, and yeah. it was great. But over time, I think it lost its um, intention as to what the meetings were. So we were meeting, but a lot of times those conversations were very just talking about one specific student, but then you end up talking, but there's never really a resolution or a takeaway that you're gonna be able to utilize. Mm -hmm. And that was the big turnaround for us. So then when we were introduced to collaborative response, we recognized, wait a minute, this is gonna be separate from PLCs. We can keep the PLCs, but yeah. if we work through the structures and processes with the collaborative response, and our conversations are much different, it actually changed our PLC conversations. You mm -hmm. know, so our PLCs were more, um, you know, curricular, instructional, those kinds of things, but our collaborative response was different. But so it, it totally changed those conversations. And then not only that, I think, did it help the students? Absolutely. But I always tell people, I saw such a huge impact for staff. They to be able to come together and to collaborate, to be vulnerable with each other, to be able to say, here's my key issue and not be embarrassed about it or yeah. feel like, you know, they caused this problem or anything like that. And then everyone's just rolling up their sleeves and they're in it together. I saw this, these collaborative response means, but then all of a sudden I saw these conversations taking place around the water cooler, or teachers would actually say, you got a few minutes after school, I want to follow up on whatever they talked about. So it just opened up these conversations because teachers were getting excited that they could walk away with something, give it a try, or a colleague would support them and they would do it together, you know? So yeah. like here, I've told the teachers, you know, if you get a suggestion to try something and you say, I like that idea, but I'm not sure what it looks like. Let me know. I will go cover that teacher's, or I'll go cover your class. Go observe that teacher so you can see what it looks like mm -hmm. and, and then give it a try, right? And so there's always something actionable. And so the, the conversations change and um, just the, I don't know if you want to call it morale or maybe teacher wellness, right? Mm -hmm. Their own, you know, they weren't feeling defeated because they weren't doing yeah. it on their own right well and i always marvel at the idea of i could be teaching across the hall from somebody for a decade but i never get to see them teach we may not have had direct conversations about each other's instructional practices and when i can start sharing out well here's how i go and approach that that's a different type of conversation than we may have had again for a decade's time that we've been teaching together but never really been exposed to one another's instructional toolboxes in a intentional way yeah and what's interesting is i think prior to collaborative response we were, we were focused more on students so if i had an issue going on i would kind of label it as a specific student so if i were to reach out to a teacher I would only go to teachers that actually taught that student. Right. Where now we're not focused on, on a student and we're focused in on a key issue. You could talk to anybody. You could say, hey, this is happening in my class. Is this happening in your class? Because it's an issue and you're not talking about a student, it opens up that you can talk to anybody on faculty, right? Well, and I think the thing that's interesting with that too is when it's placed to a student, it's often easy for me to deflect the responsibility of, well, there's not much I can do until the kid does this or whatnot. But when we do what you've said, it's it naturally puts it back to reflecting on my practice and the things that are in my control. And um, I, I think that's a powerful thing for us as well. I'm super excited to hear that's been the experience for you. So Colin, one more question here uh, before we end off. And it's one that we ask every one of our guests that come on. In the spirit of if you knew then what you know what you know now, what advice would you give your past self 
in relation to the collaborative response work and specifically leading the collaborative response work. We'll be right back to continue this episode. Are you looking to maximize the collaborative capacity of your school or district? Are you wanting to take your professional learning communities or response to intervention work to the next level? Have you started the work in collaborative response but are looking to reignite your plans? We want to have you join us at the 2024 Collaborative Response Retreat happening May 3rd and 4th in beautiful Lacombe, Alberta. Over the two days, we have an intentionally designed program of breakout sessions, panel discussions, and supported team planning time to ensure that you walk away with a plan for introducing or strengthening collaborative response in your organization for the upcoming year. With a concentrated us on team planning, networking, and individualized support, the Collaborative Response Retreat is an outstanding opportunity to grow your team's understanding and implementation of this powerful support framework. We are also planning some fun social times so you can relax and enjoy some activities as a team in our historic community of Lacombe in central Alberta. In addition, participants will gain access to an extensive repository of online resources to deepen their understanding and support ongoing implementation. Plan to join a growing network of educators dedicated to responding to the diverse needs of their learners. We've capped our attendance at 140 participants, so make sure to register early to secure your team spot. We're looking forward to seeing you in Lacombe in May. And now back to our conversation. Yeah, I think um, vulnerability, like that's such a key word for me. As, uh, as soon as I see, you know, whether it's administrators or whether it's teachers coming together when they're vulnerable and just open, the, the conversations are just so wide and expressive and people are helping each other. And so that would be the suggestion I would give myself in the past is just be vulnerable and, you know, be willing to come forward and say, Hey, this is what's going on. And um, because as one person, I mean, it doesn't matter how many years you have, you don't have all the answers, right? Someone else has got a, a you know, a tool chest, like you say, but they've got tools in it that you don't have. And, and the other big one too is, is, um, you know, often the teachers will come together and another one of their colleagues will come up with a suggestion and they may say, you know what? I used to do that, but I actually haven't done that lately. I'm going to give it a try again. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it's just that bringing back those best practices that they used to do for, for a previous class or in the past. And now it gives them that energy again to say, I got to try that again because it worked before. So. Awesome. Well, Colin, any last words that you would have or suggestions, thoughts in relation to um, leading collaborative response that can end off our, our time here together? Yeah, I think the I think the final thing I would say is for anyone is, um, you know, take it slow, but eventually build a structure and then just dive in and get going. And you're just going to see those conversations uh, so powerful, so rich, and then uh, and quick, actually, like I said, you can walk away with an action in hand within three, four, five minutes, and then you're on to the next key issue. Um, but yeah, I would encourage any school or any division to really take a long look at collaborative response and see the value behind it. All right. Well, thanks so much, Colin. And I know we'll get to connect again in the new year as continue to have the honor of being able to engage with your school and with um, your district colleagues as well. And as mentioned off the start of this podcast, we're super excited to have you come and share with our um, collaborative response retreat. It's, I think it's going to be a great time in Lacombe. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing your your wisdom around this this work. And thank you for the great work that you're doing for your students, your staff, and your school communities. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you very much, Curtis. So normally when we engage in key learnings, I have someone to talk with, to uh, engage with Lorna, or we've had our previous host, Jen, being able to bounce ideas off 
but I'm going to today go solo on some key learnings from that conversation with Colin. And first off, want to start with, wow, what a sense of, of commitment to, to helping to support staff, to be able to ensure the best results for students. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to know and see the great work that, that Colin does through his leadership role in, as mentioned, three different schools now. But there was a few things that really stood out from the conversation. The first, I think, is the understanding that the fidelity to the process is so important. And as he mentioned, even the feeling like the something as simple as meeting roles, is that really something we need to do? But understanding that it is a part of the process and that you will reap benefits from attending to it with fidelity and with the understanding that go slow, infuse each piece with a degree of intentionality and then give time to um, learn and understand as a staff team. I think that was a really a, important message that Colin shared there. I think the other one that came through was that idea of being vulnerable, that it's really key to the entire process. And it doesn't happen initially, but from a leadership perspective, when you can model that vulnerability and model the safety and being able to say, I'm not sure what the response is for this key issue, but let's explore it together. It's really so important to be able to then over time build high, high levels of, of team safety and, and psychological safety uh, amongst those that we're working with. So I love that messaging that he shared around vulnerability as well. And I think the idea of really focusing in on the collaborative structures and processes, it's key that that Colin shares that out. We've often said it's not a coincidence that that puzzle piece in the foundational graphic is twice as large as the other two components. It, it really is critical. And I think it's super exciting how Colin and the rest of the leadership team have embedded that into the day, made it really intentional and have put the degree of energy and resources into it. So thank you so much to our, our guest today and really hope this has been yet another opportunity to build upon your understanding of collaborative response and more importantly, what it looks like to lead it within a school building. So until the next time, wish you all the best and take care. Make sure to follow us on social media. Subscribe to the podcast and the Jigsaw Learning YouTube channel to access past and upcoming episodes. Join us again to continue to build your own capacity in leading collaborative response in your context.